that this Quran came down in seven letters. Sabati Ahru. Fakra Umati Saramin. Read from these letters as you want. The first battle, the battle of Yamama, 700 Hufas lose their lives. Now, what happened is one of the first battles that took place after Prophet Muhammad left was the battle against Musail Makadab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem amma ba'd. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassil li amri. Wahlu al-uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Qala Allahu ta'ala fi al-furqan al-hamid. Inna nahnu nazalna al-dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Sadaq Allahu al-azim. My beautiful audience brothers and sisters and children. Uh, for the last few weeks, we have been speaking about the preservation of the Qur'an. Tonight, we're going to move towards a very complex issue pertaining to the preservation of the Qur'an. So I would want your undivided attention. You have to be very attentive. Um, before we speak about the preservation of Qur'an in the time of Abu Bakr and then in the time of Usman Ghani radiyallahu ta'ala an I would like to open up a topic that is very very relevant to the preservation of the Qur'an you would remember that a few weeks ago we were speaking about the Qur'an that we read now like Alif La Mim, Thalik Al Kitabu La Raybafi, the Quran came down upon the Nabi of Allah. But the Nabi of Allah says, Uti Tul Quran wa Mithlahu Ma'ahu. That with this Quran came down something very similar. Alama Jalaluddin Sayyuti in Al Itqan, he makes mention that with the Quran that the Prophet of Allah received, something similar came down. And I made mention that what came down upon the Nabi of Allah was the meaning of the Qur'an. Remember? Surah Qiyamah, Surah number 75, verse number 16, 17, 18 and 19. So the Qur'an came down and with the Qur'an came the meaning of the Qur'an to the Nabi of Allah. Then we opened up the topic of Wahiyya Matlu and Wahiyya Ghari Matlu. Do you remember that? I'm going to, going to open up another topic. So don't be surprised by this topic. Many of the Muslim world do not know about this. But this is a topic that is used by the critics, especially the liberals, Muslims that are liberals, and those that have made it their mission to criticize any aspect of the deen. So <clears throat> there's a hadith in Bukhari. There's a hadith in Bukhari. I'm going to read the words, then translate it, and then we're going to try to understand it in a very easy manner. It's a very complex issue. Inna hadal Qur'an unzila ala sab'ati ahruf faqra'u ma tayassara min. So this hadith is in Bukhari. In which Nabi Akrim Ambassadah says that this Qur'an from Alif La Meem or Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen to Al-Nas Unzila ala sab'ati ahruf was sent down upon the Prophet of Allah in seven letters. Sab'ati ahruf. Ahruf is the plural of harf and it means seven letters. Faqra'u ma tayassara min. So from the seven letters read what is easy for you. From the seven letters read what is easy for you. So let's go back. That hadith of Bukhari, or the hadith that Alama Jalaluddin Suyuti makes mention of in Al Itqan, that the Quran came down and something came down that was similar to the Quran. That is one hadith. And that means the meaning of the Quran. This hadith that is in Bukhari, the Nabi of Allah speaks about something very different. That this Quran came down 
in seven letters. Sabati Ahru. Fakra Umati Saramin. Read from these letters as you want. Now, <clears throat> what does that mean? What does that mean? So I'm going to explain that because that will have a very strong correlation with the preservation of the Quran. So I'll give you an example. Sometimes when the Prophet of Allah was receiving revelation, the revelation is of nouns and verbs. Ism and fi'l. Nouns and verbs. Sometimes the noun may be singular and sometimes it may be plural. Wahid and jama. Now when the Prophet of Allah was receiving, he received both. Sometimes he received so in one revelation, Allah Almighty made it such that the Prophet of Allah could recite that noun as a singular and could recite that noun as a plural. And both were okay. Both were divine. For example, there's a, there's a verse in the Quran, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ وَتَمَّتْ Kalimatu, kalimatu rabbik. Now this kalima is a singular. But when we study the different ways of reciting the Quran that are in line with the seven letters, we come to know that it is recited like this as well and it is okay. وَتَمَّتْ kalimatu rabbik. وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّكَ So from singular, it becomes plural. And both styles, singular and plural, were given to the Nabi of Allah. Got that? So when we say seven letters, it is the difference of reading certain places of the Qur'an where the singular is recited plural as well, and they are both divine, and it doesn't change the meaning. Right? وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكْ وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّكْ Got that? Alright. The second is, sometimes the word is given to the Nabi of Allah as مُذَكَّر and مُؤَنِّث So the Prophet of Allah received revelation. It is feminine and it is masculine at the same time. For example, La yukbal. This ya before yukbal indicates it's for muzakkar, masculine. La yukbal. But the Prophet of Allah received it as la tukbal as well. So in one revelation, the Prophet of Allah could recite that word as la yukbal and he could recite it as la tukbal. And both were divine. Got it? Number three, we know that in the Quran there is Fatha, Kasra, and Dhamma. Sometimes there were two ways of reciting one word. For example, Hal min khaliqin ghayrullah. This is in the Quran. Hal min khaliqin ghayrullah. The Prophet of Allah received this. And he was given the permission to recite it a little bit different as well. Two ways to recite it. Hal min khaliqun ghayrillah. Ghayrullah in the first one. Ghayrillah in the second one. Both styles of reciting this verse from the Quran are correct and they're divine. This is in line with the seven letters. The seven different ways of reciting. All right. <coughs> In Arabic, there is a word known as sarf. And sarf is the pattern of word formation. Morphology. It's called sarf. Morphology, the pattern of words. Dharaba, dharaba, dharabu, dharabat. So sometimes, there is one word in the Quran and the Prophet of Allah was given permission by Allah to recite it a little bit different. Ya'rishun 
and you can recite it, يُعَرِّشُون the formation of the word يَعْرِشُون and you could recite it, يُعَرِّشُون so this is another direct manifestation of سَبْعَةَ أَحْرُفْ the seven letters then we know of a word known as نَحْو syntax نَحْو and that is the study of the rules of formation of uh, sentences the grammar. So sometimes we find that in the Quran, and remember this because we're going to use this letter a lot. Nun shizuha, nun shizuha, and it has been recited by the Prophet of Allah as nan shuruha. Now I'd like you to focus upon the word. If you can, if you can write that word in your mind, it's going to help you. Nun shizuha. Now remove all the dots. Remove all the fata, zamma, and kasra, and you can make nun shuruha from it as well. Nun shizuha, remove the dots, remove the fatha, remove all the a'rab, and you can make the same word without the dots, nun shuruha. So this is sab'ata ahruf. So try to keep this in mind. This is very important to understand the next part. So do you understand that the Prophet of Allah received revelation? One, he received with the revelation, the meaning of the revelation. And the second thing is when he was receiving the revelation to make it easy to pronounce the words, there were many, many words in the Quran that the Prophet of Allah was allowed to pronounce two-way, three-way, different ways. And this is known as the seven qira'ats. Eh? The qira'ats. All right. Now, last week we made mention, I'm going to test you. If somebody was to come to you as a critic and say that, look, the preservation of the Quran in the early days was all oral. I say, as a Muslim, no, it was not all oral. It was writing as well. So the critic says, prove it. What story will you bring that is very, very famous that proves that the Sahaba were not only orally preserving the Quran, they were writing the Quran as well? What is the story? Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Remember? So Hazrat Fatima bint Khattab, she was reciting the Quran from writing the opening verses of Surah Taha. And I gave you a few other examples as well. Where the Nabi of Allah says, do not take the Quran ila ardil adu to the land of the enemies. So there was Quran written down. But majority people had preserved the Quran orally eh, and through the uh, hafidha, the power of retaining information. Now, Prophet Muhammad leaves. Nabi Akrim Muhammad after delivering the entire Qur'an to the Sahaba, he leaves. Now I ask you, and you are students of history, students of the life of the Nabi of Allah, after the demise, or let me say after the hijrah, the departure of the Nabi of Allah, who became the Khalif? Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. Now when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq was appointed as the Khalif, was it easy times or hard times? Very hard times. Very hard times. Many, many scholars say that يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Where Allah Almighty says to the Nabi of Allah that many, many people will enter into the fold of Islam in droves, in multitudes, in large groups. But when the Nabi of Allah left this world, يَخْرُجُونَ Many, many people exited Islam. There was a wave of apostasy. A wave of people deserting Islam. And not only deserting Islam, because they entered into Islam without knowing. And I've made mention that many, many people, many, many people, in my journey as an imam, for whatever reasons, they accept Islam without 
allowing their heart and their intellect to accept Islam. And I'm going to, you can read between the lines. They accept Islam without their hearts and their mind accepting Islam. And they get married. And then after a couple of months or one year, two years, they fall out of pretending to be Muslims. And this is disastrous for that person, for the Muslim sister, and the child that comes from that wedlock. So we can realize that in the time of the Nabi of Allah, it was the most popular religion. It had gained momentum. And there were many, many perks attached to Islam. There were many, many perks attached to Islam. So many, many people started to accept Islam, but not truly understand Islam. So when Prophet Muhammad left, there were many that started to leave because they couldn't see further perks. And many of them, they went back to the tribal system. And the chiefs of those tribes, they thought that Muhammad, he stood up and he said that he's a prophet and the whole Arab peninsula followed. We can do the same. We have a tribe. So Musail Makadab, he did the same. He became an imposter. Aswad Ansi did the same. So what happened is there were many, many fronts that Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq had to attend to preserve the fort of Islam because the fort of Islam was under attack. So people were leaving and people were claiming to be prophets and then there was the threat of the Roman Empire attacking Islam, attacking Madinatul Munawwara. So it was like the Muslim world in Madinatul Munawwara was being suffocated. It was very, very hard times. But Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq stood his ground he did not give an inch. He stood firm and uh, basically repelled all those challenges. Now what happened is one of the first battles that took place after Prophet Muhammad left was the battle against Musail Makadab. Because Musail Makadab stood up and he said that I am a prophet. In the time of the Prophet of Allah, he gave a proposal to the Prophet. He sent a messenger with a proposal to Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, And he said, look, you can be the Prophet of the cities and I will be the Prophet of the villages. And if you don't accept that, then announce that once you pass away, I am the Prophet. So he proposed this to Prophet Muhammad Wasallam in his lifetime. Of course, it was not accepted. It can't be accepted. So when Nabi Akrima Muhammad left this world, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq thought that this is the most important pressing issue that we have to repel, we have to address. So a mighty army was put together to crush Musail Makadab and his followers. This battle is known as the Battle of Yamama. You read in the books, Jange Yamama, the Battle of Yamama. And there's a place there known as Hadikatul Maut, the Garden of Death, in which many, many followers of Musail Makadab were killed. Of course, Musail Makadab was killed by who? Yeah, Wahshi. So, Jazakullah. So, Musail Makadab, the imposter in the Battle of Yamama, was killed by Wahshi bin Harab. And Wahshi bin Harab is the one that in the days of darkness, in the days of infidelity, was responsible for the martyrdom of Hazrat, Abba, uh, Hazrat Hamza in the battle of Uhud. So he used to say that, inshallah, on the day of judgment, I will be able to stand in front of the Prophet of Allah and present my work that I crushed the imposter and Prophet Muhammad will forgive me uh, and allow me to be with him anyway. I'm going to bring a statistic to you. I've read in many, many Islamic books 
that from the time the Prophet of Allah became a Prophet to the time he exited, small and large battles, about 29, more or less. Small and large battles, skirmishes, about 29. In 29 to 30, you can say uh, skirmishes, fights, battles. From both sides, 1,056 people died only. Remember this, this number, 1,056. Under 1,100 people died, meaning died or attained the rank of martyrdom. So I'm talking from both sides, Muslims and non-Muslims. So, the Prophet of Allah fought, people fought against him. This journey carried on for many, many years until the departure of the Nabi of Allah, but only 1,056 people lost their lives. Only 1,056. That brought a revolution in the Arab Peninsula and we are reaping the benefits or we are enjoying the fruits of that revolution till today. And as we know that humanity will enjoy the fruit of this revolution until the day of judgment. 1056. You know, there's a, there's a verse 107. Verse 107 of Surah number 21. Surah Anbiya. We all know it. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Prophet Muhammad is mercy. This was a manifestation, a true depiction of the mercy of the Nabi of Allah that a revolution had to be brought in the world. A Messiah had to be sent to pull people out of the ditch of darkness. But only 1,000 people more or less lost their lives. The Prophet of Allah leaves. Rahmatul lil alameen leaves. The first battle, the battle of Yamama, 700 Huffars lose their lives. I'm not talking about all that lost their life from the Muslim side. I'm talking about the group of Huffars, the group that knew the entire Quran of by heart. 700 of them died, attained the rank of martyrdom in the Battle of Yamama. Now you can, you can understand that they didn't have Qur'ans like we have Qur'ans. Majority people had placed the Qur'an in their heart. And they were muallims, they were teachers. And these were 700, even in this masjid. We look at the huffaz very differently. True? And we have the Qur'an on paper. But still we look at them differently. They can perform certain duties that you can't. They can lead the ravi, they can lead the prayers, they can sit down in the corner and children can sit down with them and they can learn the Qur'an. Now think about it, when we speak about conversion, there was a group from Yemen that came and the historians, the Muslim historians speak about it proudly and they write in their books that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu they say a group of 700 people came from Yemen and collectively accepted Islam. 700 is a big number. 700 Hufas die in the battle of Yaman. Now what happens? Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, and remember this. Remember the word. One is a muhaddith and one is a muhaddath. What is the difference? Of course the pronunciation is a different. Muhaddith, muhaddath. Muhaddith is the scholar of hadith, the theologian of hadith, like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Tirmazi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. They are muhaddith. Now the hadith in Tirmazi, the Prophet of Allah says, every ummat has a muhaddath. And the muhaddath of this ummat is Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Now what does a muhaddath mean? Muhaddath is the one on whom's heart Allah Almighty sends down a message. That's why the scholars, when they study the life of Umar radiallahu ta'ala, they say there were 17 places 
where Hazrat Umar said something before revelation and revelation came down to endorse what Umar said because he was a muhaddath. So Allah Almighty sends down a message. You can't call it wahi. It's not a revelation, but it is like an ilqa. Inspired. Ilham. Inspired. So Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and he says to the Prophet of Allah, I just don't feel comfortable that our Muslim women are wearing a certain attire. I desire that the Muslim women wear hijab. Allah Almighty sends down the verses. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and says, I desire that behind Muqam Ibrahim we pray two rakat nafal. Allah Almighty sends down the verses. This was a muhaddath. So the muhaddath of this ummah is Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. I make mention of this hadith because you need to understand this. 700 huffaz die. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and the farasat, the vision, the foresight, the status of being a muhaddath all come together. He comes to Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. Now Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq is to the letter he follows the Prophet of Allah. To the letter. You will understand that when all the Sahaba, even including Hazrat Umar, came and they said, don't dispatch the army of Usama bin Zaid yet. There's too many problems in Medina. You are dispatching this army. It's going to go towards the Roman boundaries. Don't do that right now. And even if you want to change the general, Usama bin Zaid is too young. Who's saying this? Umar, who's muhaddath. But Abu Bakr Siddiq said, no, no, no. He said, I cannot stop this army because this has been dispatched by the Nabi of Allah. And I can't change the general. Because the general has been appointed by the Nabi of Allah. He used to follow the order to the letter without any change. Keep that in mind because I'm trying to, you know, because I, I don't want to rush through this. This is a beautiful story. Two, three stories we're going to make mention. So now Hazrat Umar comes to Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. And he makes mention of something that we're going to disclose a few, in a few moments. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq calls for Zaid bin Thabit. You remember I said, remember this name, Zaid bin Thabit. Hafiz of the Quran, a scholar of the Quran, a teacher of Abdullah ibn Abbas. That in itself elevates the status of Zaid bin Thabit. So Zaid bin Thabit is summoned by Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. Now this is what happens after the battle of Yamama. He's summoned by Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says, look, O Zaid bin Thabit, a few moments ago, Umar came to me. A few moments ago, Umar came to me. And Umar said to me, O Khalifatul Muslimin, the leader of the Muslims, 700 people have died who are Hufaz in the battle of Yamama. And there are many battles in the pipeline. And if Hufaz die at this number, at this rapid, large number, there is a question. There's going to be a problem that we are going to face in terms of the preservation of the Quran. So right now we have many. So it is better that we put the Quran together. This was not done in the, prophet, in the time of the Prophet of Allah. Like one Quran, we put it together. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says to Umar, remember I said to the letter, he said, how can I accept this and do this when the Prophet didn't do it? How can I do this and commit to this when the Prophet of Allah did not commit to this? Hazrat Umar says, Ismi khair. Now the muhaddas is speaking. He said, there's good in this. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq said, how? I, I can't understand this. The Prophet of Allah did not do it in his lifetime. How can I allow this? Hazrat Umar says, there's khair in this. Second time. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq counter-argument. He said, how can there be any khair? When the Prophet, if there was khair, the Prophet would do it. Prophet didn't do it. Hazrat Umar says there's khair in this. When he said it the third time, Allah opened the heart of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Opened the heart of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. And he said that the khair that you can see, I can feel it now. The khair that you see and you feel, I feel it now. 
So now Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq says to Zaid bin Thabit, he says, oh Zaid bin Thabit, I order you to take on this responsibility and collect the Quran, make a copy of the Quran. Zaid bin Thabit responds to the order of Abu Bakr just like Abu Bakr responded to the, to the request of Umar. It took him three times. They, they, these were the sahabas. They said, how? Because his heart had not opened. So the Khalifa is saying, but if the heart is not ready, I'm not going to accept this because this is about deen. So just like your heart opened, my heart has to open as well. So Zayd bin Thabit is rejecting. He says, no. How can they be good in this? Three times said by Abu Bakr Siddiq and Zayd bin Thabit's heart opens from Allah Almighty. But Zayd bin Thabit says, if Abu Bakr told me to wash the mountain, that would have been easier than discharging this responsibility. If Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq told me, go and wash this mountain that is near to impossible mission, he said that would have been much easier than collecting the Quran. So now starts the preservation. Now we made mention last week that the Sahaba, many Sahaba had one verse, two verses, three verses. How many scribes were there? I made mention last week. Katibine Wahi, writers, how many? About 40, you remember? These were the official ones. But there were many others that used to write. But they were not official. And Sahaba, few Sahaba had one surah. Few Sahaba had two surahs, few Sahaba had three surahs, few Sahaba had all the surahs, and with the surahs they used to have the bayana, the commentary of the meaning, the commentary of the word. So they had that as well. Now, Zaid bin Thabit is appointed. Now try to understand what happens. So Zaid bin Thabit is a hafiz. Zaid bin Thabit is a hafiz. He doesn't need assistance from anyone. Any verse that is brought forward, that is written down, he can endorse it, reject it according to his hafidah. But that will make it weak in terms of preservation because that is the hafidah of one person. So it has been made mention that with Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit, who is a hafiz, another hafiz was attached. Who is that Hafiz? The Muhaddas. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. A lot of people don't know this. Hazrat Zaid bin Thabit, the first Hafiz. The second person of this Jama'at is Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala. And both are Huffaz. Both are Huffaz. And we know the strength of their Hifas that they could recite the whole Quran in one night. So there was no stutter. They knowing of the Quran was like Kulu Wallahu Ahad. But now you've got Zaid bin Thabit, you've got Hazrat Umar. But look at how careful these people were. The condition was, and the announcement was made in Madinatul Manawara and the adjacent suburbs and you know Muhallat and you know cities, that whoever has any one ayat, any one ayat, one verse, bring it. But the condition is that that verse has to be written in front of the Nabi of Allah. And there has to be two witnesses that can become a witness that this verse was written in front of the Prophet of Allah and the Prophet of Allah accepted it. Not that easy, eh? Now, many, many Sahaba had the whole surahs. That was not accepted. Those surahs were brought, but now the announcement is made, all single ayat be brought forward. Single ayat. So now all the Sahaba that had the ayat written, 
with the condition that this ayat has been written in front of the Nabi of Allah and the Nabi of Allah has accepted it and there are two witnesses that came forward. There was one verse, only one Sahabi had. Verse 128-129 of Surah Tawbah. Beautiful verse. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمِ Let me translate it. How beautiful is this verse? This was the only verse that only one Sahabi had. That met the condition. Right? What does, the, what does it translate to? Verily there has come unto you a messenger. Yani Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From amongst yourselves, it grieves him that you should receive any injury or difficulty. Anything that grieves you, grieves the Nabi of Allah. He, Muhammad sallallahu is anxious over you that you be guided. Azizun alayhi. And In order that you may enter paradise and be saved from the punishment of hellfire for the believers. And he is full of pity, ra'uf, and rahim, and merciful. This verse, one verse, was only found by one sahabi, Abu Khuzayma. So, people had it written down, but it didn't meet the condition. Hazrat Umar knew it was a part of the Quran. <laughs> Hazrat Zayd bin Thabit knew it was a part of the Quran. Everyone knew it was a part of the Quran because it is a part of the Quran. But that condition, that one ayat has to be written in front of the Prophet of Allah and in front of two witnesses. That condition was not met. The only, and now they're getting, you know, they're getting confused. They're getting, you know, uh, troublesome. What's going to happen? And Abu Khuzayma comes. And he says, this is the verse. I was a scribe, I wrote this down in front of the Nabi of Allah and these are the two witnesses. Alright? Now, all this, now, the Sahaba that had one entire surah, Sahaba that had 15 surah, that was there as well. So now these individual verses are checked by the memory of Zayd bin Thabit, checked by the memory of Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. Then, these individual verses that meet that condition are checked with the surahs that are put together by the Sahaba as well. These are the precautions that were taken, a lot of people don't know, in terms of the preservation of the Quran. Now, once this nuskha was put together, I asked you, what is, what is this copy called? It is called Um. Remember this. This copy that was put together by Zayd bin Thabit, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, with these conditions, in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq, is known as the copy Um. Um. Remember that. Now, now this Um is 114 surahs, but in division. The surah is complete. But you won't say that Surat Baqarah is before Ali Imran. And Nisa comes after Ali Imran. They're all mixed up. Surats are mixed up. So you may pick up the copy and in the front you may find Surat Nas. But you'll find Surat Nas in totality. So the Surats were put together. But the Tartib of the Surats, the order of the Surats was not maintained. Now, I mentioned in the start, and why I mentioned that was, Allahu Akbar, the seven letters. Remember the seven letters? Sab'ati Ahruf. This nuskha, this copy accommodated the seven different letters. Remember that. It accommodated the seven different letters. So the only way you will accommodate the seven different letters is where you don't have the Arab. You don't have the Fatah. You don't have the Dhamma, you don't have the Kathra. For example, La Yuqbal. The Prophet of Allah in many places has recited La Yuqbal as La Tuqbal as well. 
So how will this copy accommodate both recitals? You remove the dots. You remove the fata, the dhamma, the kathra. So this nuskha of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala is known as um. It is individual surahs. The surahs are not in order. And it accommodates the different styles of reading. All right. This one nuskha, it was only one. When Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and left this world, he left it with Umar radiallahu ta'ala. He left it with Umar radiallahu ta'ala. When Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala was leaving this world, he gave it to his daughter, the wife of the Nabi of Allah, Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. Then in the time of Hazrat Usman, it was given as a loan to Hazrat Usman, and we'll speak about that next week. And then it was returned. Then Marwan bin Hakam from the Umayyad dynasty asked Hazrat Hafsa to give that copy to him. She did not. She did not give it to Marwan bin Hakam. When Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala passed away, Marwan asked for that copy. What is that copy known as? Um. And then Marwan bin Hakam burnt it. Why he burnt it, you will know next week. There was good in that as well. Why he burnt it, there was, there's good in that as well. So he asked for that copy from Hazrat Hafsa in a lifetime. She didn't give it. Most probably she knew that he will burn it. And once she passed away, he called for it. It was given to him, that copy known as Um, that was put together by Zaid bin Thabit Umar in the time of Abu Bakr, and it was burnt, reduced to ash. All right, this is part one of the preservation of the Quran. Do you need a recap? Or is that too much for today? We'll do the recap, inshallah, next week in the start. We will go to part two next week, and that is the preservation of this Quran in the time of Hazrat Usman al Ghani. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته